Hi, everyone. Uh, nice to see you here. Uh, and for those of you that we're not seeing, but that are hopefully seeing us, nice to uh, have you on the other side. As we begin uh, this event and as a part of it, I invite us all to be mindful of the elders, relatives, and children of, ba of the Wampanoag people whose unceded territory MIT occupies. And I acknowledge on behalf of MIT and all of us here, the indigenous people as the traditional stewards of this land, as well as the enduring relationship that exists between them and their traditional territories. MIT is also one of Massachusetts State's land grant universities and has, through the Morrill Act, received financial benefit from lands taken from indigenous people in other parts of the US. I acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced occupation of indigenous people's territories. And I'm also mindful of the descendants of the black people whose enslavement is written in different ways into the wealth of this institution. I hope for these acknowledgments and invitations to mindfulness to point us towards further important conversations and actions. A few logistical announcements regarding asking questions tonight, and hopefully it will be clear when that moment uh, arrives. But for those of you who are here in person, uh, please use the microphone uh, at the front of the room to ask questions. It's important because that's the only way to transmit uh, the sound through our streaming. And if you are watching online, please feel free to post questions wherever you're watching on the webcast page or Facebook, and they will magically uh, make their way to us on cards uh, and with help of Aiden and the crew. And now, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Yolande Daniels tonight. It is a bit personal. Uh, I met Yolande two decades ago in the trenches of Columbia GSAP, where she was an important role model for me a few steps ahead. By the time I met her there, her reputation had preceded her. Daniels's collaborative practice with Sunil Bald, Studio Sumo, which they founded in 95, had won the Young Architects Award from the Architectural League of New York in 99, and their work was therefore published and widely circulated in the League book titled Scale. And the studio had also been one of the finalists for the prestigious MoMA PS1 Young Architects Program in 2002, which is at the beginning of that sort of uh, project. She had also completed silent witness projections, intimate landscapes of the shotgun house and the de facto de jure project. Now, I didn't know all of this work well at the time, but uh, our standard femme pissoir spoke to me immediately. It was visceral and humorous with a capacity to radicalize its audiences then and now, which is why it has been revived in 2020 by the Storefront for Art and Architecture uh, in their television series. In New York and elsewhere, Daniels's commentary on the physical encoding of gender inequity and uh, work examining the material and social scars of racism seeded important transformations in the discursive and cultural space of architecture. Daniels's design interventions told and tell stories in the medium of installation in beautifully crafted objects, in hauntingly rendered data, in which she focuses on topics that pertain to what she terms subordinate spaces, and their inverse, spaces of both domination and of neutrality. In her own description, this theme and orientation of the work towards uncovering and grappling with subordinate spaces and shaping the relationship between the social and the spatial collect Studio Sumo's built work and Daniels's research and teaching under an important and coherent umbrella, a liberatory practice. Her recent independent research project, Black City, the Los Angeles edition, was exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art in New York in 2021 in the exhibition Reconstructions, Architecture and Blackness in America, which was curated by Mabel Wilson and Sean Anderson. I hope we'll hear about uh, that project, as well as the current chapter of the Black City project titled Black City, Arkansas Edition. Uh, throughout her career, Daniels has been simultaneously operating through her highly recognized collaborative practice and working on her personal research, garnering a series of prestigious grants and residences in the process. 
As part of Studio Sumo, Daniels has been responsible for over 10 constructed projects. She is both a researcher and a consummate practitioner of architecture, and I'm personally excited both to have her here with us now as a colleague and to hear and talk about her work tonight. Daniels, or Yolande. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction, Anna. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, a pleasure to be here as full-time faculty, a pleasure to return um, with like colleagues and friends and um, meet new students and, uh, and work on my, my, the things I love. Um, so there's a, dialogue boxes here. Uh, okay. Oh, you can see us both. Okay, you can see me and <laughs> I wasn't sure what was happening. Okay, um, all right. So um, anyway, great to be here and um, the lecture is titled Building on Building, which is a, um, a framework I've been using um, for some time to, to kind of talk about the different types of production um, that, um, that I'm engaged in and, and what I call my practice. Um, so kind of what Anna said um, about uh, my practice was that I have a partnership um, with Sunil Bald in Studio Sumo, and then I have independent research. The independent research has been done through the office and, um, and also done outside of the office, so it's, it's not like a cut and dry thing. Um, what I'm gonna start with is the, um, the office, the, the um, built work. Uh, just so that you see that. And uh, most of the work was done in uh, Japan, some in the US. Um, most of the work is in um, either, uh, it's all institutional, a little bit residential. So it's either universities, uh, museums, um, or residences of different scales. So like private residences or dormitories. <laughs> Um, so the uh, university work um, was done with one university, but they have four, four campuses, and we have projects on three of their campuses. Our relationship started um, as uh, instructors, so beginning teaching there, um, teaching, I taught um, a class about gender and space, um, which is like the early work that I've done was looking at gender and space. More recently, I've been looking more at race and space. They're part of the same project for me. Um, and so the School of Business Management, which you see an image of right now, that was our first project. It's a 75,000 um, uh, square foot uh, business school slash graduate um, center. And um, it has two auditoria, uh, cafe, graduate wing, um, you know, offices and classrooms. And in the Japanese projects, on all of them, we've had the kind of um, opportunity to work with one company, Obayashi Construction Corporation, that has, um, they have like a range of design services um, in their office, and that's very typical of the construction companies. And so they have an interior design office, a landscape office, um, you know, all the engineers and everything, but they also have design. And so we've worked with one design group. Um, some people have kind of come and go, but the, the main um, kind of figures in the design group, we've worked with them continuously on our projects, and we've kind of grown up together, which is interesting. Um, so these are um, just views of the project. And we, we have our hand on everything. So the projects in Japan, we come up with a concept, which is like a drawing. Um, usually there has to be a compelling story about it. 
And then we, um, usually with our concept, we um, kind of have a landscape concept and also an interiors concept. So in this project, there was this idea of a pattern that kind of went through everything and changed. The pattern stayed the same, but the material changed depending on whether it was inside, depending on whether it was um, organic material versus inorganic material, lighting, um, you know, that kind of thing. Um, we choose the color palette, uh, we choose the furniture, and we also, in this project, designed some of the furniture. So this is furniture we designed. Um, and uh, this is in the back of the building. It kind of bridges a hill, and you can see the, the bottom of the hill um, in the lower level. And then um, as you move above, you're on the top of the hill. Um, Dwelling. This is a um, this is a, a, a townhouse um, in Harlem. Um, well, not a townhouse really, because it's four stories. But it's um, it was a duplex for a single man who um, I guess you could call him a bachelor, who um, basically just wanted to gut the space and have a lot of light in it. So it's two floors at the top. Um, and the, the central um, kind of uh, approach was to um, open up the space, uh, kind of maximize the double height aspect, and um, let in a lot of light. Uh, what was really interesting about this client was that um, he couldn't sleep with light, so we had to put in blackout shades. The first image was showing the blackout shades, so everything could kind of go dark at night, but then in the daytime, it was just like, you know, this beautifully lit place. Um, the stair, we actually really like designing stairs. Um, and so this one is very light. Um, and then there's his master bedroom, which you see on the other side. It's all very open, um, all the kind of cabinetry and the bathroom, they're sort of hidden behind the woodwork. Um, you're actually looking in this image through a shower, which um, just has like glass and the, the uh, floor is wood. Um, so you don't really see it. And then when the door is open, it just kind of disappears and you just look out onto the deck. Another campus project. So this is a dormitory. Um, when we first started this project, uh, the, we, we basically worked on this project about there were, I think, at least three iterations of it, and I think it was over six years. So from the first time we did sketches and then pr made proposals to the final um, construction of the project. And what happened was the client at first wanted a village. So she wanted um, like small buildings. I forgot to say the client, uh, the chancellor of the university was a woman. Um, and so we were working for a woman. A lot of our clients actually have been women, um, like Asian women, black women, uh, white women, but we've worked for a lot of women. And I, I think that's, you know, partly, it's great. Like that's partly why we got the work. Um, and um, so she wanted a village, but it's actually the most expensive, um, you know, kind of construction. The cheapest construction is a double loaded corridor building. And so, um, you know, initially she was resisting that, but then in the end, to get the dormitory done, we had to, you know, we had to be very cost effective. So with all the Japanese projects, they're very cost effective because they're university projects and we never went over budget. Um, so basically, in this image, the red circle is the site, and then across the street on the other side is the main campus. So it's an expansion of the campus, kind of like the way the dorms um, on the other side of Mass Avenue are like an expansion of the MIT campus. So this is the um, dormitory. Um, it's actually mixed gender, but it's mixed by floor because um, there. A fully co-ed concept um, doesn't fly in Japan at the moment, um, but they can be like in the same building on different floors. And there are also at the ends chaperones. Um, 
So you enter the building kind of from the center, and if you go to um, if you go to the right, um, your right, you are a student and you're kind of entering into the dormitory. If you go to the left, you may be a student or a visitor and you're going into a reception area or a gallery, um, you know, kind of more formal. This is if you've sort of moved through the reception area actually um, to, uh, uh, through the gallery to an outdoor sitting area. This is above that outdoor sitting area where the students have a kind of um, private space. It has a library and a small like kind of uh, kitchen. Um, then behind the facade, the facade is south facing. Behind the facade is an uh, kind of um, open air uh, corridor. And it's actually a double corridor. So behind the doors, the glass doors, there's another corridor. And the bump that comes out from the facade, these kind of balconies that project out, the idea behind them is that when the glass doors are open, the space kind of triples. And I mean, in actuality, we wanted like that solid wall to be a glass wall, but it contains all the services. So that's where like mechanical is and that's where structure is. So um, we had to be happy with these glass doors and then a way of maximizing the space. So the sliding door is open and then the space kind of flows out that way. Um, so there is a non-conditioned space um, in one corridor and then beside it, a conditioned space. And then these are just some of the details. Um, these are the dormitories. We designed um, these desks so that the beds would be above and the desks would be below because the dormitories were pretty compact. Um, and so um, we had to kind of make space for studying as well as sleeping. And there are rooms for two people. There's room for one, like very kind of luxe rooms, two people, four people. Um, and it was based on um, you know, what students could pay. And this campus is actually um, an international wing of the university. So they have students from all over the world. And they had to kind of meet different price points for it. The detail of the exterior, it's a concrete building, precast concrete. Um, well, one face is precast concrete in the north the building itself is cast in place. And then the front uh, louvers are a, um, they're basically an off the, sh off the shelf system that we um, kind of customize to get it to, um, to have this effect. So it's a louver that has different um, depths um, and that, that's how it was designed. Um, and we just kind of tweaked it a little. So this is the view of the south facade with the jutting balconies. And then um, to the left, you see the, um, the gallery space and the outdoor areas that I showed initially. Um, in the light, the, the aluminum takes on uh, different color casts. <laughs> okay, so the red dots, which you might not be able to see so clearly are actually um, two buildings. Um, so the business school is between the R and the T. So that's to your right. And at the U, there's another building. So the R and the T, uh, the business school is our first building. And then we were asked to, uh, to return to this campus to design another building. So the business school is at the rear um, and the other building is at the entry. Um, so it's the first building you see when you come in. It's a museum. Um, it houses a collection of Japanese prints, Yukioi prints, that the um, founder of the university collected. Um, it's a, a kind of um, building within a building. So it's a concrete shell, um, which is poured in place with a precast shell on the outside. Um, I was supposed to say there are two entries um, and I'll, there's another image that will show it. So these are kind of showing the, um, 
It basically consists of three galleries, three boxes, a black box, a white box, and a glass box. The glass box is the one below, and it's most open to the landscape, so the building appears to float. On either side of the boxes are ramps. Um, we did the ramping initially because uh, they wanted to save money on an elevator. However, once a curator was involved in the design, uh, the curator was, you know, not having it. So the project got an elevator, but we kept the ramps. And one of the things that's interesting to me in design is the way that there are these decisions that you make that are based on, you know, the information that you have at the time, the constraints at the time, but often they change. And then sometimes the logic just doesn't make sense anymore. Um, and sometimes, you know, the logic is gone, but it still makes sense. So this is one of those cases where, the logic is gone, um, you know, not having an elevator to save money, but, and we have these ramps, but the whole project was about that and everybody loved it, so we just, you know, we weren't gonna scrap that. Um, these are the two ramps. Uh, the ramp on your right-hand side goes down. Um, so one of the things about, like, our buildings in Japan is that we, um, We've designed them in such a way, like both the business school and this one have two facades, like two entries, um, which um, I don't know, is a little unusual. Um, each entry has its own you know, kind of um, prominence, but there's also a way that you can walk through the building and um, we call it like a non-paying entry. So you walk through the building without going through a door, without asking for permission, but you get the experience of the building. So the ramp that goes down enables you to fully experience the building. You experience even more, you experience the landscape, but you, you know, there are no barriers. If you go on the other side, which is your left, that's going into the museum. Um, so in the middle, you would kind of enter the museum. At the end, it's a dead end. You have to kind of come back to go into the museum. So I mentioned it was, it was kind of like a doubled building. So there's an idea about um, the kind of exterior shell, you know, this concrete that's on the landscape that then kind of wraps, um, wraps the programs and encases them. And then there's a, um, the port encase uh, shell, which is inside, which is conditioned. Um, so again, there's an unconditioned space with a conditioned space inside it. And the conditioned space is basically to protect the art. The other thing is the motif on the facade is related to um, the motif of rain in Yukioi prints, where it's kind of these uh, dash lines, um, and we were, we were kind of playing with that idea, both inside and outside the building. This is the reception area when you come in, um, and if you go to um, your right, that's the white box gallery where the figure, the person is, and opposite that to the um, left is the black box gallery. So white uh, box gallery is like contemporary art, black box is more traditional. Um, uh, kind of uh, gallery for Japanese art. So here you can see the, the three boxes um, on the two plans. And then also what you're looking at on your right is the, um, the kind of like formwork for the, um, the treatment of the port in place concrete on the inside, which is, um, it's a very traditional Japanese technique, which we actually saw in a court building in Japan. <laughs> But, and then we learned more about it. Um, but it's, um, you press the boards in the concrete as it's curing and it gets the um, imprint of them. So the idea of this was that the inside has this kind of rougher texture and then the outside is, is kind of you know, precast and smooth. So this is the more traditional gallery without art in it. Um, and then this is the glass box gallery where you can basically just kind of circulate and go on your way. Um, and then this is the view kind of looking back at the building. Okay, I think this is the last building project I'll show, Mokada. So it's kind of a transition into the um, research work because Mokada is a project that um, 
that has both, you know, it had a client, it has, uh, it's a gallery, it has, you know, spaces that we had to design, but then it also has a component, um, a part of it, which is um, related to my research. Um, so we were asked by the client uh, to make flexible spaces, which many people want um, for museums and galleries. And then the other thing she asked for was a map of Africa in the reception area. Um, we have had at this point, we were working, one of our clients was the Museum for African Art, and we had made, uh, I think it was something like, I don't know, 10, maybe 10 exhibits for them. And every exhibit uh, for the museum, we had to make a map of Africa, of the area in Africa where it was. And so every exhibit, we were trying to like come up with a different way to make a map. So we were making these different, you know, just exploring how to make maps and communicate. And so, um, so when we were asked to put a map of Africa, um, you know, the question of like what what version of the map of Africa, you know, would you put up? Um, we thought about it a lot, and um, because it's the Museum of Contemporary African Diaspora and Art, we wanted to make a map of the African diaspora. And so that was, you know, what we basically proposed to the client. So I think, like, maybe one thing um, just which is of interest, like, in working with clients and versus working in school um, is that, like you can propose things that are beyond what the client is asking for. Um, so like we had that experience in Japan um, and definitely that experience with this museum where you know the client asks for a map and you know she has one idea of a map but then you know we have a different idea of a map and it depends on how you present it. Um, and in this case it, it kind of um, you know met her mission um, so we, um, we went forward with that. So um, the images, I'm sorry, are a little blurry, but it starts with um, migrations, forced migrations, as well as, um, I guess, economic migrations, which you could say are forced too. But um, so looking at uh, migrations of, of um, uh, African descendants, descendants of Africa from, um, uh, the transatlantic slave trade to military migrations um, to um, just other kinds of economic migrations. And what's interesting is that the dots fill the map and, you know, black people are everywhere um, in places you wouldn't really expect them to be, which was very interesting. So, you know, so part of, so this is the project within the project, which is this mapping exercise, which tells a story about the African diaspora. We were interested in depoliticizing the map um, because the map as it's drawn um, because of colonialization is very fraught. Um, what we settled on um, was not, not that it's depoliticized because it's highly politicized, it's just, so politicized and so crazy that it fit. Um, so we used the time meridians. Um, and for me, like what was really, I, I don't know, I think it's like an idiotic thing to like try to put this grid over the, the world. And then there are these places where, um, you know, it kind of just doesn't work. Um, but anyway, it just seemed to fit. And so we went with that. And the idea was to take this two-dimensional map and wrap it in the surface and then project it into 3D. So the, the goal for the project was this play between two and 3D dimensions. So like not to have it flat, not to have it just be an image, but to have it be the space. So um, what you're seeing here is the wrapping in the reception area of the museum, the furniture kind of projecting out, and then beyond it is like the um, facade with the identity of the museum, and then these kind of large panels which um, are custom that rotate on a pipe so that like the wall can kind of rotate out, and each wall rotates out and can make different size spaces. So these are the views. We work with an artist who took our drawing and then um, painted it on the ceiling and the walls. 
Um, we also work with the graphic designer who took our concept for the windows for the identity and helped us do that. And then like just this really amazing um, woodworker in Ithaca who um, built the furniture using um, a kind of dowel connections, so no screws. Um, we didn't ask him to do that. Um, we loved that he did it, um, but yeah, that was, it was really great in a, in a way. All the people we worked with, it was a small project. Um, all the people we worked with were wonderful. And then these are the panels. Um, so they kind of rotate on um, pipes um, with like casters on the bottom and we made these custom um, uh, uh, like kind of rotating cuffs for them and when they're against the wall the idea is like there's a pocket so when they're against the wall it's flush. Okay so um, that was kind of the introduction. That's the work with Sumo and I, I wanted to try to find a way to show them simultaneously, but I have to get a little more tech savvy to do that, like to have a split screen or something, because the work happens at the same time. It's not like um, that work happened before um, this work, or um, you know, often the same projects are going on in the in the office at the same time, and I need to find a better way to represent that. So in the research, there's architecture. Um, you know, in a way like the big categories are gender and race, but it's really about um, subordinate spaces, spaces about dominance, uh, subordination, um, and, and I think like, like the main thing, part of it is trying to understand the world the way it is, but then it's also to propose other, um, you know, like other conditions. Um, so, okay, building and building race. This is a, a diagram that's in um, progress, uh, which is about, like, it's actually covered up, but it's a black hole, it's a little dot. And it's this idea that, um, like, when you see the dot, you only see a dot. You don't see any definition, you don't know what's in it. But then when you zoom up, each time you zoom up, you get more information. And then, like, when you zoom up the most, you basically find a world. So that's the idea of this, and, um, and it's, it's actually an idea for um, a project I'm working on, which I'll show you. So this, this came out of the Los Angeles project, um, and the dictionary plates I was making, and this is actually the black plate. So I've been looking a lot at um, blackness, um, working on this project, Black City, and I thought it, I would make a, a dictionary plate for it but I will come back to that. So Intimate Landscapes was one of the um, earlier projects and it, it basically looks at domesticity um, and it thinks about in it, like I'm considering, um, like, I mean, ultimately what it became about was the idea of domesticity for people who are enslaved, um, which, you know, I think like when I first kind of got to that question, um, it's, it's things that we don't often put together. We don't put the idea of the domestic with people who are in bondage, but actually they did, um, they did exist together. So how did I get there? In this project, um, it, it's a place called Project Row Houses in Houston, Texas, and um, it's, it actually was designed by an artist like not designed, created by an artist who um, with another group of people um, bought a series of row houses and there are like eight row houses along a line here but then there are also row houses behind it and then a kind of court in the middle. So on the behind side that's where um, single uh, women live with their children and as long as they're uh, kind of going and going to school, they can live in this uh, community and um, have like free childcare and things like that. And then on the other side are artist residencies. So I was um, like a resident um, for I think it was ten months or so, 
um, like making a project in this house. What was unique about this house was that um, it was uh, stripped. It had nothing in it. It was a perfect, a perfect gallery space. It was uh, painted white um, and it had you know, no walls or anything in it. Um, other people, I guess, weren't so lucky. Um, but so, so it was this almost like um, whitewashed house. And so um, starting with the house that all the you know, data has been kind of taking out of it and then starting to do research on um, shotgun houses and looking at the construction of the house for any traces um, I could find about like um, the way people lived in it was how the project began. Um, so the shotgun house is a kind of um, vernacular house type. It's said that that house type comes from West Africa, from my research. So looking at that, like looking at the house type, its like origins, thinking about it as um, a kind of artifact of plantation landscapes for um, the people who worked on the plantations was kind of getting me toward this idea of the domestic. Um, and so um, I wanted to find out more about uh, ideas about like, um, well, I wanted to project um, life, ideas about the life inside the house, um, you know, where it was absent. And so reading about plantation um, architecture, plantation landscapes, what was really interesting was that around the plantation, it was mostly um, like landscape and that um, in between plantation to plantation, uh, there were these kind of wild areas that um, people who worked there, enslaved people would go to, um, sometimes with like, you know, at great risk to like um, commune with each other. So, you know, in the, the kind of landscape that was where, and the landscapes were policed to prevent it, but that was where people could have church. That's where they could get married. That's where they could get news about other people. That's where they could run away. Um, and so um, the plantation landscape started to become really, really interesting as a way to understand um, the community of the enslaved. So I, from that, looked at slave um, narratives. And um, from the narratives, um, I basically grouped them into different categories. So one was about um, coming together, like for communion. The other was about um, love. Um, there were many narratives about you know, the risk and the, the kind of uh, loss of um, related to love. Um, and there were the most curious though was um, I put it under the category autonomy, which was people um, they're kind of relating stories where they had a sense of, of themselves because we don't associate autonomy with slavery. Um, and so so each of these types of narratives were um, kind of um, put on the, um, this is a sketch of showing like the different zones and how the narratives would then be um, projected inside the house. Um, this, so that was the different zones. This is the idea of projecting them. Um, the windows were used to put the narratives on since the house was white, the text on the windows was also white. And then when the light would shine in, so the text kind of disappeared like everything else inside the house. But when the light sh would shine in, it would make shadows. Um, so also there were several um, light boxes, like lines of light that were put in the project. One is um, the, uh, so shotgun, the, the name comes from the front door and the back door being aligned with each other and this kind of, um, sort of, I don't know what you call it. It's like a mythological, it's like a negative mythological story about, you know, shooting a shotgun from one door and the bullet going all the way through the other. So this kind of violent story mapped onto a, a like um, black domestic landscape. So the, the white line is a path of light, um, which would be the, the path of the bullet. And then what was curious about this house was that there actually, 
you could see where the, the previous walls were. So those became light boxes, um, which I made <laughs> and then installed um, in the like floor and on the walls and yeah. So um, then this is just a view, not such a great one, but of like the white text and the, the kind of shadows um, that would be cast inside the space. And another, another zone that was further in the house where um, there were these narratives and um, the shadows were cast. So um, de facto de jure um, is another research project. So this project was, both of them were done by invitations um, to kind of take part um, as a group. And so for this invitation, I was invited to um, pick a city. Actually, for the Los Angeles project, I was also in a group where we picked cities. Um, and I picked Philadelphia, and this is showing all the other cities, and they're basically on a train line going from south to north, north to south, and this was a, a main migration route um, of people escaping the Jim Crow um, south coming to the north. Um, and it was called the Southern Crescent Line. It was called the Crescent Line, and it was the last train to become nationalized as part of Amtrak. Um, and now it's called the Southern Crescent Line, so it still exists. Um, so, so the premise of this was a bit like um, looking at the Green Book and the idea of um, the risk of travel for African Americans um, in the, um, like basically after Reconstruction, like 1866 to 1966 pretty much um, in that period. And so um, each person kind of um, had a city and, and did a project. So my project became a way of mapping all the cities. So from Philadelphia, I, I made a game. Um, the idea is that you're a traveler, so it's a role-playing game. You spin a dial for a city you want to go to, a time you want to go there. It's between 1866 and 1966, which is kind of between two um, civil rights acts um, and roughly, and then you spin a dial for a public accommodation you would like to go to. So de facto de jure basically looks at public accommodation segregation. Um, so you would spin this dial, go to a place, and then you would find out what the laws are. So there was this key that um, of each of the public accommodations, you'd find out which public accommodation um, was affected, whether you had access or not had, have access, what the penalties would be if you broke the law, um, who the penalties were, like the penalties were interesting because they targeted specific people. So um, sometimes they targeted conductors. Um, so if it's like riding a train or um, some mode of transportation. It was a penalty toward um, the passenger who's making the infringement, but also the, um, the conductor who's letting it happen. Um, uh, penalties for, like, say, interracial mar marriage would be often against, um, often it was like it was the minister and it was white women. Like, they didn't really have white men. Um, that they gave penalties to in the laws, but they did penalize white women. Um, other penalties had to do with, um, like, uh, when the railroads were being built, there were lots of laws about um, uh, Chinese. And, and a lot of these laws, basically with public accommodations, reflect um, discomfort uh, about like labor, actually. So, you know, people having jobs, but then um, and in competition with each other, but then also being close to each other. So that's what the public accommodation um, rules were about. And so then, of course, all of this was mapped. We did many, many maps um, trying to figure out how to represent these ideas. So this is basically um, a kind of dot matrix. Um, the bigger the dot, the more density the smaller the dot, the less. In this matrix, up is north, 
this, the kind of center is sort of the Mason-Dixon line and then below is south. And so what's interesting, well, do I point here and you see it? No, I have to point here. There, okay, so that line, that is reconstruction period. So after the Civil War, when there was a Civil Rights Act that was passed, when there were actually progressive laws for um, blacks, minorities, um, that's reflected there. And then this period is after that. And this is, so that's like 18, 66, let's say, and then this is 18, 1965 um, in the South. So this is what is referred to as the Jim Crow era, an era where there were repressive laws um, that restricted um, movement, restricted um, employment, and everything else. And then the top part is the North. Um, so in this story, what's really interesting, so here, this is just another version of the same map, which is um, kind of showing it like in a linear way. We worked a lot with the iconography of trains. Um, that didn't actually go as far as like um, just this kind of map. I forgot to say the center is um, the train and the further you get out, so it goes from public to private and everything starts in the middle and it's basically the same left or right, the same up or down. Um, so what this map um, represents, all the loops that you see are laws that are passed and then um, it's like a backward and forward where like a, maybe a progressive law is passed and then a regressive law is passed. And so that happens in the north, this kind of shifting back and forth. Um, a little bit like the era that we're in now. Um, and so all of this had to come together in a travel valise that was like um, a requirement. And um, so this is just, you know, trying to figure out how to put in all the cards, all the maps, the game, um, you know, that you open it, it's a game and the game you know, t teaches you about this history, but it also engages you as you play it. And then the outside is basically a kind of segregation index. So it's like the segregation um, as a topography. So Black City is um, like the, a kind of big project I've been working on over time. And it starts with this idea of Black not really about black people, but black as um, this kind of um, metaphorical construct, um, which um, actually has a lot of contradictions. You know, it's like, it's both positive and negative. It's both powerful and it's scary. And, and then it's also um, a, a kind of like concept that is like folded onto people. Um, and so, so these are like just looking in the dictionary of all the different definitions, all the kind of work it can do, um, which is one of the things that like I'm really interested when I look at race is like, you know, what is the work that race is doing? And so this is about like the work that black is doing. Um, and so sometimes it's like, you know, it makes you really cool. It makes you like edgy. Other times it makes you a pariah. Um, other times it's just who you are. So, um, so anyway, kind of starting with this into the idea of the black city. So the first project that I did, um, it actually started with not really, um, uh, not really like knowing with questions about, about the black city. It was like black city question mark, but wanting to um, like, uh, this was also for a show at the Studio Museum group show, um, we were all responding to gentrification in Harlem. And um, so gentrification at this time, which was like early 2000s, was a question. It was like this mystical thing. Um, and so, but it was taking over, you know, neighborhoods like Harlem. And so, um, so I wanted to basically 
do the project Black City Square, which is Black City Square, the miscegenation game, which is to come up with just hybrids and like alternative ways about thinking about the city. Um, and I, I did that project, the, the, a prototype for that project, but, but I got really wrapped up into just understanding the dynamics of cities and like cities and race. And so this diagram that you see is, I had several of them, like just kind of mapping the way that um, blackness um, and like a city like New York, the way that it operates. Um, so that's on the right hand side and then on the left hand side is like this kind of game of going into um, making hybrids. Um, so this is just showing the parts of the diagram. So one parts of the diagram has to do with laws. There are implicit and explicit laws. Um, these laws affect um, people's ability to um, occupy space. Um, the laws, um, they kind of um, influence policies. And so that's one of the, these are the chips in the diagram sort of expanded. And so all of these are images from my um, installation at the Studio Museum, which was a, a video. Um, statistics, um, so looking at how statistics occur um, at different scales. So what you're seeing here are the different scales from like neighborhood to nation, um, but then also um, how um, the statistics kind of back up the policy. And sometimes they um, reveal something that exists, but other times they actually um, justify something that people want to have happen. Concepts. Concepts is something that I've been uh, kind of puzzling over for a long time. Um, there are these words as I was reading that, you know, just kind of um, stuck in my head, like white flight, um, black belt, um, minority is one, I think um, race is one too, poverty line, glass ceiling. Glass ceiling came up a lot with women. Um, and then forms, you know, of course, as, as an architect, it's like, well, you know, how does this influence form? So a lot of the work has been just trying to think about the relationship between our thoughts, ideas, and the forms and spaces that we create. This project was, this version was based on like demographic data. So it was the idea, I was using census tracts, and it was actually the idea that every, everyone is basically you know, data when it comes to like the census. So you're these dots and it was looking at um, the movement of the dots, the movement of people over time. So the idea of white flight, black belt, um, they actually are inverse to each other. Um, so as the sub suburbs were, um, you know, kind of growing and um, the white population was going to the suburbs, then that kind of gave rise to like this, like, um, a version of a black belt. The term came before that, but um, but it relates. Um, so anyway, like these were like three D models looking at dynamics and then thinking about value. The idea of flipping value, um, especially in a place like Harlem, um, especially when you're thinking about gentrification. Then thinking about techniques for subverting the system. Techniques for um, um, like just getting over. Um, and so from, for that, I was working from Henry Louis Gates, The Signifying Monkey, and uh, kind of making these field conditions based on um, like 12, um, a dozen of um, uh, like kind of subversive acts, let's just say that. Um, so that was like that project. Um, the um, Black City Square. And then I continued to work on this, just trying to think more about like field dynamics and dominating a field. So in a more abstract way, how you kind of flip the value in a field. Um, then um, these are just studies like of it, doing like Lego block studies of it, like making games. And then that kind of takes me to Black City, the Los Angeles edition. 
Um, so in this project, I made um, uh, dictionary plates, a glossary, um, and um, maps. And basically, it's looking at black settlement in Los Angeles from, um, well, actually from before it became um, a United States um, state because it was founded, Los Angeles was founded by the Spanish um, who kind of came and colonized um, the Mexicans and then they were fighting back and forth for some time before um, the Americans kind of came in. Um, but what's interesting about the story of Los Angeles is that um, African descendants were there from when the Spanish came. Um, and, and then just the relationship between like the Mexicans and the Spanish are also very interesting. So, um, so one of the projects is this dictionary that, um, that basically um, it's related to the concepts that um, I started to collect and was interested in earlier. So the dictionary actually is becoming the home for the concepts. Um, and it's, it's basically like citing them, defining them, referencing them. Um, and in the dictionary, there are things that are general. So they like kind of operate on a more global or national level. Um, and then there are things that are specific to each uh, city or state. Um, the idea of this came from a previous project. So it was by um, two women who made an urban dictionary. Um, and, and this was something I would do with students. And, um, and then I, it kind of occurred to me that I could, um, it could be a house for the concepts. So for the museum, I, I did a glossary, which is a more pointed um, version of a dictionary. You don't have to cite your references. You can make it more creative. And it actually tells overlapping stories. The stories were related to these plates um, that I made. So there are dictionary plates that are kind of inspired by um, uh, kind of like uh, illustrated dictionaries. Um, and so there are different types of concepts. Um, race is sort of like a meta concept, which talks about you know origins and hierarchies and uh, domination and subordinates. And so you know this was one of the plates. It's also um, an obsolete term, although we still put it to work. Um, so the images there had to do with cataloging people, but then also on top of those catalogs, um, making hierarchies and um, you know, grading them. Then another origin plate is the origin of um, uh, Los Angeles. Um, so in the plate itself that you see, that's kind of the, the Mexican, um, it's downtown Los Angeles, the Mexican history, um, but also it overlapped with Chinatown, which was erased downtown. And in that area, that was where many of the minorities, like Chinese, Japanese, um, African American, early LA was, was very polyglot, just like it is now. So there were people from all over living there, but they were kind of confined within a certain area. Um, so this is just an origins plate, series of origins plates. Then a ghost map. This is the map. Um, so basically, this is Sanborn maps and um, maps where we're kind of looking at uh, the change of the city over time. So. Um, the base layer is the contemporary city, and then all the other historic layers are floating on it. This related to a model that I had in the installation. Another plate, which is Mason Block. So Mason Block was owned by Biddy Mason, who was a former slave who sued her owner for um, freedom and actually won it. And then she went on to become um, basically like a millionaire by the time that she died through real estate prospecting. Um, so her story is in the plates and in the glossary. Um, so where I am now, I did just like a really big leap. Which is telling me I need to go 
faster. Wait. So this is a preview, I guess. OK, so I'm going to do this pretty quickly. This is the, the project I'm working on now, um, Component House, Totem House. So my office, um, we were invited to um, make an affordable house prototype by Crystal Bridges Museum. Um, and we were asked to do an installation on the museum grounds for the exhibit Architecture at Home, which opens in May. Um, and so we realized, we kind of quickly realized that we didn't really have enough money to make the house prototype and that the installation would be something different. So that's why there are two titles. Component House is the, um, the original idea of the house and then the installation version of it is Totem House. So the idea of the house is that it's basically four components, four domestic components, the black um, rectangles that you see that um, divide the space up, but that also are the main support for the house. Um, so this is kind of, um, it has this huge roof, which, um, you know, kind of comes over um, and like basically makes the, the outline of the house. There's a kind of, um, it's similar to a Japanese Angawa space, these patios on the side that the big eaves of the roof make. And um, it's a house that flows. Um, so, you know, you can put doors to like say, uh, close off the bedroom, but otherwise the space would be open. So these are just the plans for the house. The entry is at the bottom right. And then you kind of move in and um, like circulate the um, more private areas are to the back. It has um, a bedroom on the lower level and a stair that goes up to a bedroom on the upper level. Um, so these are just moving through the house, the different components. So at the site, um, what was very interesting, well, first we had to like find out about Arkansas and um, uh, Crystal Bridges is, um, in Northwest Arkansas in the Ozarks and it's very wooded. Um, so we wanted to do something that kind of was about the, the, um, the just kind of respected the, the nature at the site, which is the forest. Um, so the project would be wood. Um, and then also um, Crystal Bridges is right next to um, the reservations in um, Oklahoma. Um, it's like where that red dot is just um, to the other side, uh, to the right hand side, there are um, like at least seven nations. Um, so we started with um, the land acknowledgement and then with this idea of the components of the house and we're thinking about like um, just aspects of the site are that it has many historic trails um, one of them being the Trail of Tears that went through it, the Civil War Trail that went through it, and like how there are these, and, and they have, um, you know, the, the trails are connoted, connotated um, uh, through the site, so that um, we would, in a way, make um, an installation that was kind of like using the components of the house as indexes of the indices of the place, um, but also indices of the, the proper house. So in these components, there would be um, the program of the house would be imprinted in them, but then also these kind of narratives related to the trails would be in them. And the thoughts that we had in our mind were um, totems, but also henges, and then Japanese rock gardens. So we started with the idea of grounding, and that's kind of the Japanese um, dry garden idea. Um, this is the site, um, so we're like grounding, and then we're putting in the components. The final design is a little different than this. It's, it's more um, skeletal. Um, and so it's the idea that um, we're kind of making a sacred space 
um, but we're also making something which is of the forest. Um, there are other architecture, um, pieces of architecture nearby. Uh, that was a Fly's Eye Dome by Buckminster Fuller. Um, so the components imply the roof as well as imply the domestic um, uh, spaces. So I'm just gonna go through this. There's like a kind of idea about lighting. So, so that's like the, um, the project my office was doing. And then we were asked you know, to relate to the community. And that's where then the trails and the history of the site um, kind of uh, dovetailed into my research. So Black City, the Arkansas edition, which is basically looking at the trails um, of Native Americans, African Americans. Um, well, like, what's really interesting about the Civil War Trail is that refugee, um, refugees from slavery um, went to uh, the Civil War encampments and they, um, this thing called contraband camps, so they were considered contraband, war contraband, and they formed camps where wherever the Civil War encampments were. Um, and so along that trail, there was this other trail of the um, contraband camps. But then also that trail coincides with the Trail of Tears. Um, so in researching Arkansas, looking at African-American um, like populations and history, what was really interesting was the absence of them. And I had learned from my research in Los Angeles that um, like, that often like, well, okay, I was just kind of curious because there was an absence of them and I had read about sundown towns and I started researching sundown towns and the absence of African Americans in um, Arkansas was a result of ha them having sundown town laws. So sundown town laws were basically um, laws that prevented African Americans from living in, um, in states and cities. And so um, what happened though is that uh, after Reconstruction, so like after 1866, 67, um, these contraband camps became uh, the first free towns. They became places that um, African Americans settled in and, and started to build communities. After Reconstruction, so like 1860s to like um, you know, kind of like 1920, um, these towns, they started to grow. And you know, there are towns you know about like um, uh, Greenwood in Tulsa, um, where um, it became like, you know, Black Wall Street, or um, in um, Wilmington, North Carolina, um, or in Rosewood, Florida, these towns that, you know, they started to become prosperous and they were actually burned down. And so that was this period where um, communities had started to settle and grow and thrive, and then they were um, ex extirpated. Um, and so, um, so the project became about looking at the expulsions of um, minorities in um, Arkansas, so Native American expulsions and African um, American expulsions. I have this database where we're um, collecting all the um, events, like the, the things that happen, like treaties and wars and um, uh, other events, and then it's all kind of put into a timeline. Um, I've been working a lot with timelines in these projects of the events, and then um, events that occur over time are more, you know, like movements. And then they're, they're kind of mapped onto objects. So here they're mapped onto the components of the house, on the ends of the component of the house. And so there's this kind of um, time grid that goes over the whole installation. So as you move, you go in 50 year time blocks and you just kind of read like about um, 
settlement history, but it's in the context of events that are happening in the nation. So this is kind of an unfurling of the um, uh, components where is a way that we figure out like um, how to do the layout of the um, uh, timeline. And then this is an image showing just a little bit of like what it looks like with the timeline on the um, components. It's actually gonna look very different than this because we're taking out all the horizontals and so you're going to see the skeleton, and then you'll have um, the timeline parts that um, fill it in in places. So these are just some of the details of um, the different parts. So I'm going to go like just really quickly. This is the project Anna mentioned, but I'm not really going to go into it because it's a whole other area of research which deals with gender, and it uh, takes the form of um, a a urinal for women, um, and I will end there. Thank you very much. We do have time for uh, a few questions. Yeah. I have a few softballs. <laughs> softballs. Uh, <laughs> Um, well, one, I've asked you, but thank you for this lecture. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, the first one I've asked you before, so, you know, in a different context, but I feel like it's important to reiterate in, uh, in this room and, uh, you know, the virtual room for this audience. Uh, and it's about the split screen that you invoked um, oh. uh, in, the, in the middle, uh, a kind of relationship between practice and research and how you think about these activities uh, and their relationship in your work. Um, so I, I really wanted to show the Arkansas project because um, like it's a project where, like there are a few projects like Mokada is a project where you can see there's you know, the architecture project and then there's the research but they're together. And so this is very similar where um, you know, my research is a layer on the project, but it's so integral to the project. Um, you know, the actual installation when you see it that, um, I don't know, I, I, I think it, it speaks to how um, I approach the two things like research and practice. Um, they're not, there isn't like a cut, mm -hmm cut off between them. Um, so I'm just, yeah, I don't know. Um, there well, isn't a cut off. You sort of mentioned, you know, uh, the kind of the notion of presenting uh, the activities that happen simultaneously, uh, yeah. simultaneously on the screen as a split screen. And so there's, a, some, there's something about them occurring at the same time in the same minds, right? Uh, but to what extent do they inform one another and oh, how yeah. does that sort of I know, occur? we always get that question. So when, when our practice was really young, um, we got that question and it was, it was like really frustrating, but, but it also, I think, wasn't, we didn't know how to answer it, but it also wasn't visible, but I feel that now it's visible because the formal approach to both is the same. And like before coming here this morning, I met we, you know, we had our office on Zoom and um, with like my partner and then two um, interns and we are basically working on the architectural form and then we're so, you know, working and then I'm working with one of them about the research. And so it's like you have a conversation about one and then you have the conversation about the other and, and it's kind of, and we're all one team. So, you know, and everybody listens to everything. So we're all informed. And so then like when we're, when, when, when we're making forms like um, the early, so what was it, Intimate Landscapes, that one had the light boxes. We had been doing a lot of light boxes. I like making light boxes. I would do the wiring and stuff myself in our installations. I don't do that anymore. But, um, but like we just had a lot of light strips, these kind of lines of light so that there are these things that you know, one of us is interested in that just kind of carry through. So there are lots of 
lines and lots of random patterns. Um, they're actually controlled random patterns. Um, and this idea of um, a pattern kind of moving across surfaces, so it's like one pattern, but then the materials change, or like there are certain preoccupations that um, it doesn't matter. It could be in their research or it could be for a client. Uh, maybe this next question is related, but it's maybe we'll move away so you don't have to keep thinking about uh, that relationship. But I am want, in wondering and interested in, in tools um, in part from that first question, right? So some of the recent work on race uh, and architecture of which the Black Reconstruction Collective at MoMA was a part, as well as much of Mabel's uh, writing and intervention has put a big question mark over architectural tools, I think, over the discipline, perhaps, of architecture or its formation, its reproduction, its propagation as a discipline. And so I'm wondering uh, how then, or maybe I'll ask you the question that sort of Mabel takes Audre Lorde's uh, notion about master's tools and poses it as a question. Uh, what can we do with master's tools? And I'm wondering if you want to articulate for us what you do with master's tools. So my first reading in the seminar and one of the students is here, Jensen, that was a reading that I gave. Um, and because um, I'm kind of enthusiastic about um, making things about tools, um, but like the tools that, so, uh, okay, um, and we talked about this in the seminar because um, what has enabled me to work has actually not been architecture. It's been stepping outside of architecture and using tools from outside architecture to enable myself to produce within architecture using architectural <laughs> tools. So, so like the tools for me are actually um, text and looking at like, um, you know, other like writers and other strategies that have to do with post-colonial thought and agency and liberatory practices um, that have been going on for some time, but in other disciplines. Um, and, and then like being able to translate, you know, something from another field, another discipline into something that works in architecture. So I, I feel that like that has, that has been what I've been doing. So when I um, graduated from Columbia, like after grad school, I did a fellowship at the um, Whitney Independent Study Program. I was accepted into two pro versions of the program, but I had to do it one after the other. So I applied to studio art and I applied to critical studies. Studio art was on the basis of the urinal project and I was basically um, challenged to build it. So I had the drawings of it and then in the studio I built it and that was my final project. Um, but when I was uh, in the studio program, I was working on the black city, like the beginning of, I wrote an essay, Black Bodies, Black Space, um, Awaiting Spectacle. And so I was looking at um, research in fields of representation. It was a lot about you know, representation and otherness, and that was very helpful. Um, it, there wasn't the same discourse in architecture, and, and so I was trying to figure out like, how you know, this could give me agency in architecture, and just trying to do projects that were architectural. Um, the way that they worked for me was it had to be about space. You know, space is a construction, um, space is a thought product. And as long as I was dealing with space, I felt I was dealing with architecture. And so working that way, and I think it was very tenuous at first, but it became more convincing <laughs> as I did it more. Um, and so for me, that's where the tools came from, but then I was using architectural tools to produce. But, but in many ways, I use graphic design tools. I make a lot of maps and um, trying to figure out how to represent things you can't see. 
um, because when you're dealing with uh, the history of African Americans, like descendants of Africa, like often that history, it's, it's non-durable. You know, we don't have like buildings that lasted, but you do have, there are histories and, you know, there were settlements and things like that. And so for me, it's been about um, the agency that I personally find by finding out this information and that I want to share with others because, you know, going through school, we were told that, like, these things didn't exist. Mm -hmm. I have two more questions. I'm wondering which one to ask you first. Maybe, you know, I was thinking as you were presenting the uh, work in Japan, I was thinking about uh, the Office US project and the fact that when we did that, there were not very many firms from the US who operated in the Japanese context, certainly not that scale of firm uh, that Sumo is. Uh, and I'm, but I'm wondering now, based on your, or your answer, I'm wondering the extent to which your relationship to a context changes your relationship to tools of architecture, or affects them, or inflects them. Maybe, yeah, because I think working in Japan, um, so like being in, it's such a different context with different references, different, uh, different history, different design culture, like there are overlaps, but um, yeah, I think that's a very liberating thing. Um, and it definitely has had a big influence on both, you know, partners. Um, yeah, I mean, that's an interesting point. Um, I have one more. Yeah, and I know I saw that you guys got uh, little cards and, and you might have your own questions that we want to uh, invite and also uh, the audience. But I have one that's about time travel. So um, in a workshop that was held at MIT by BRC before the show opened at MoMA, you, uh, you compared yourself to the main character of Octavia Butler's uh, uh, powerful novel, Kindred. In that novel, the black uh, writer Dana, in her own time, in the 70s, the, the present of the novel, uh, begins to travel back and forth between her own time and the kind of time of slavery and her own family, I guess, ancestral kind of uh, events. And, and I cannot forget this now comparison of your own work to that sort of time travel. So I'm wondering if you have any sort of comments for us about, well, the tools of time travel that seem to be uh, part of the projects, or that at least I'm now projecting onto the work and the risks of time travel, because if you know the novel, Dana puts herself in risk, or she's not choosing to travel or not. It, it simply is uh, her, part of her life at that moment. So, um, yeah, so Kindred is one of my, I don't know, like a favorite Octavia Butler um, book. I wanted, there was a, I read, I can't remember it exactly, but a quote, um, something I was reading of Octavia Butler from an interview where, um, she was asked about, um, it was sort of about like, you know, you could say like white supremacy or like these big things like systemic oppression or, you know, like just the system. And like what, what could you do, you know? And I think the question was something like, um, is it possible to end it or change it or something like that? And so her response, which was, um, her response was that, um, that like each person has to kind of um, take it on themselves to, um, to like come up with a solution, affect a solution. 
Um, but she said something else before that. And what was interesting was the person, because the first answer was, um, oh, it was like, you know, all the crises, like, no, we can't save, we can't solve all the crises with one thing. Um, that was it. Like, there's no one thing that will save, um, you know, save us from all the crises. But if each one of us does one thing, um, then we can, you know, make progress. And what I thought was really interesting in her answer was, her answer was about each one of us having agency, like kind of believing enough in our own agency to think that we could make a difference by doing that one thing. Um, the way the answer was taken by the person was, no, we can't, you know, we can't solve it, right? So it wasn't, it wasn't that you need to step up to solve it. It was more that, you know, we can't solve it. Um, and she was saying both of those, like, you know, we can't solve it simply, but you know, everyone has to work on it. So, okay, I think I'm digressing, but, um, in that, that's no, <laughs> but like, I did want to show timelines. I think that's the next presentation because I showed them at um, MIT and in the BRC presentation. So the kind of, um, I had one image of the timeline, but um, like, all of the timelines that I do end in the future, um, but the future is pretty blank. And so the presentation that I did at MIT was interesting because I was, I had gone through all the past and then I was at that blank point. And, and this is the project I really want to work on, but like, I'm always wanting to work on the project. That's the thing I don't know, but then I'm, and I think this is the risk for me. The risk is that I'm trying to understand you know, the things from the past. And so then I don't like spend as much time on the projecting the things I don't know, which is like what excites me the most because it's all really science fiction. So what I presented at um, this, um, it was about futurity. And so what I had to do was use uh, future cones, which is this idea like using the theory of relativity of like uh, past, present, and future, and how you can kind of predict um, by pulling things from the past into the future, which is something Octavia Butler does because her um, science fiction is actually based on reading history very closely. And then, and this is what she said in the article as well, then she projects, you know, years forward, if that thing kept going, what would happen? Um, so her book's uh, Parable of the Sours is about um, just that, like kind of reading the past and then projecting it forward and kind of getting to where we are today. Um, yeah, and so, I don't know, so time travel, I think, yeah, it's definitely, I want, I want to, basically bring out the, the timelines more, but in bringing out the timelines also, um, I showed that one image of black um, where it had the multiple scales. It also brings out the way that I think about systems and how um, all of these things are kind of interrelated but at multiple scales. Um, and you know things that kind of don't seem like they're related, and I think this is probably a way to talk about practice and research, they actually are related. Um, you know, so I often think about how like if you look at, you know, like with chaos theory, if you look at something at one scale, you might not understand it because you're looking at the wrong scale. So if you zoom in or you zoom out, you'll have a different understanding of that thing. It might become more legible. And so I feel like in the work that I'm doing, I'm sort of zooming in and zooming out and operating at different scales, but you know, sometimes I think I get a little stuck in some of them. We, Huma, I need to take there the question that they have, right? That's, I'm seeing Aiden's uh, hand gestures, so. Uh, so why don't you come in and ask that, and then Huma, you can take the, the microphone. Or maybe I'll let you sit here, yeah. Come, come, come. Come, come, come. Hello. 
Hi, Jackson. <laughs> um. Okay, I'm speaking into the mic for the people virtually. Um, one question we have from the virtual audience is, you use a lot of historical data in these projects in a very beautiful way. What was your experience like in the archives and what archives did you access? Oh, um, so, okay, the Los Angeles project happened during the pandemic. So I did not access archives. I accessed data online and I had books sent to me at my home. So the archive was in my home um, because nothing was open. Um, but they were nice enough to like Xerox things and send me books um, from like the LA Public Library and USC Library. Um, but in general, like when, when it's normal times, um, I just use university libraries for the most part. I have used the New York Public Library. So public libraries like LA Public Library, New York Public Library, because um, I um, did a lot of work in New York and lived in New York, so I used the New York Public Library before. Okay. Um, there's no one else from the audience. We yeah, Hi, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation and it's kind of overwhelming to see how you've been working on all of these projects simultaneously but I wanted to ask a specific question since you employ the tools of graphic design to sort of unbuild these worlds um, the map that I was most interested in was the map of the African diaspora and because all of your projects pay so much attention to scale I was curious what the discussions were in selecting the kind of map that you use because I noticed it looked like the 16th century Mercator map where Africa and you know countries or continents in the southern hemisphere are smaller mm -hmm. than those in the northern hemisphere. So I'm just curious kind of how what the discussions were about using that particular kind of projection and is it about showing us how we see the world or is it also about, I don't know, kind of going beyond these projections and seeing the connectivity. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that question. I think it's actually both, you know, so, um, so like with that project, it took a long time um, to kind of, to figure out like, to figure out the map. Um, like often with the research projects, like you're, you're just sort of struggling, I'm struggling with how to represent something. And so you're doing many studies. And meanwhile, there's someone saying, okay, this, it's time, it's time. But, you know, actually things need time to cook. So, um, so it did take a while. Um, I was actually working on that project and the Black City Project when I was a fellow at the American Academy in Rome. So I was in Rome while I was working on it, um, which is another despatialized kind of thing. But um, I don't know. So the choice of the map, um, we, kind of, we kind of decided to choose the the most standard version, which is like the version, you know, where um, Europe and America looks big. Um, yeah, we decided to just go with that. Not really for, so like in the same way that the, the meridians are political, even though, you know, they seem, it's just a grid and they seem non-political, they actually are very political. Um, so I think like the idea in some way was to highlight some of the contested aspects. Um, yeah, I don't know if that was, that was, yeah, that was just the idea that we would like highlight some of them, but then also neutralize others. So it's like some things get neutralized, other things don't. Well, I'm wondering if Jen's 
Yes. Okay. Um, last question of the night, I guess. Um, so you spoke about the connection between gender in, in space and race in space. And I'm curious about what your take is on any connections between culture and space and what that might look like in your practice and in research and how that might influence or inform the work that you do. Yeah, I think the question, thank you for that question, about culture um, and space, like to me that reverberates with the question about tools. Um, because, you know, the question about using the master's tools, oh, the other thing I wanted to say, which was something that came up in our discussion, was like, um, like, like with the master's tools, like I, I feel that you can't, the master is not all powerful. So, you know, and so that's why I was talking about agency, because, um, you know, if you don't believe that the master is all powerful, and when you read history, you realize that the master's tools actually came from other people, came from other cultures. Um, they're yours. And so, um, yeah, so I, I think, like, just in terms of, like, freeing yourself to use them, like, um, yeah, use them. Um, they, they were stolen. Um, they were developed, but, you know, they came from other places, you know. Um, so I, I sort of moved away from your question. I kind of, like, took it and then went into another place. I'm mean, sorry. No, that's fine. I you could it. refresh my mind and I'll I just get wanted back your take it, on anything that has to do with the connection between culture and space. Yeah, so and that's practice. the thing about, you know, culture. So, like, culture and space, like... I think, you know, the tools that I'm using, they're Western tools, but they're also Japanese tools. Um, and they're also tools from my, you know, black upbringing. And they're all kind of mixed together and they're all valid um, in my practice. So. Okay, um, thank you so much. and. Thanks to everyone for coming this evening. We hope that you will join us on Thursday, March 10th at 6 p.m. for Frederick Moten, Building and Building on Blackness, Some Architectural Questions for Fella, the MIT Nomis Lecture. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>